It's a particular pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Scott Zalman for today's speaker, because Scott and I have been colleagues and friends for almost a quarter of a century. Um, Scott was born and raised in Ohio, and so I don't hold that against him. Uh, you can see that he's overcome that efficiency by now being a faculty at the University of Michigan. But Scott's, uh, the first sentence in his in NIH bio sketch is that he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 1986. And that prompted him to pursue a career in medicine um, from that point forward, understanding the pathophysiology so that better treatments could be devised. He, uh, he went to college at Kent State University where he graduated summa cum laude. Then uh, when he was in medical school at the Northeast Medical University in Ohio, he spent a year with us at the NIH. And uh, the minute I met him, I knew he was filled with energy and focus. And he's also very effective and a, and a great human being. He uh, graduated Alpha Omega Alpha from medical school. Then he went to University of Pennsylvania for his internship um, medicine residency and fellowship. And while there, uh, with us at the NIH, he studied audit transplant in a primate model that we had developed. But then at University of Pennsylvania, he continued his interest in audit transplantation by working with Mike Rickles and Ali Naji. But he also had a lifelong passion in the genetics underlying diabetes and worked with Dora Stoppers, where he discovered the CLEC16A gene and its role in mitophagy and the role that plays in diabetes pathogenesis. And when you look at GWAS studies, this CLEC16A sticks out as a signal for risk for type 1 diabetes that no one understood prior to Scott's work. He's just a quality guy, top to bottom, um, and we're thrilled to have him. So thanks for coming, Scott. It's good to see you. Uh, just thank Dave from the bottom of my heart. For, for such a kind introduction. Um, I will try to uh, live up to that, that degree of an introduction from a, a, a mentor, a friend, and uh, you know a person that I'm very fortunate to have uh, formative experiences with in my career. This talk has a little less of my science in it and a little bit more of how, uh, as a molecular biologist who's also a practicing endocrinologist, how I've seen the evolution of how we think about diabetes and integrating some cutting edge clinical studies, basic research studies, and then some work in our group to think a little bit about what I call exiting from, from the silos of how we understand diabetes. I don't think I need to tell every, anyone in this room that the incidence of diabetes is rising nationwide and exploding at, a, at an unparalleled rate, not only here in the United States, but also worldwide. As these numbers expand, um, it's been important to me to try to understand what the pathology of the diseases uh, are so we can develop treatments targeted at the pathophysiology of the disease, rather than just simply treating the numbers in front of us. We all know that diabetes is a whole body disease with um, defects in all of these different metabolic organs playing an essential role. But one thing that I want to highlight today for our discussion is this central importance of the islet of Langerhans, specifically the pancreatic beta cells, um, as central to our understanding of all forms of diabetes, with this idea that diabetes results from insufficient functional beta cell mass to meet peripheral insulin demand. So obviously my favorite cell is a pancreatic beta cell. And of course, I'm also a mitochondrial biologist, and so that's why you see this very outsized mitochondria inside of a beta cell. But we know that beta cells metabolize glucose and sense glucose, and this metabolic activity in the mitochondria is central to the um, generation of signals that ultimately lead to insulin secretion. When you look at a beta cell here on a microscopy image, you also see these cells are essentially bags of two things. We often jokingly call beta cells bags of insulin, but to my colleagues at Michigan, we know that it's not just a bag of insulin, it's a bag of insulin and mitochondria. Here are the mitochondria in red that also take up just as much cytosolic space as the insulin granules. Um, at the end of today's talk, I hope you can be as big a believer in the importance of beta cells in the development and understanding of diabetes. And I'm gonna try to be a little bit of a troublemaker but try to buck this dogmatic classification of the diseases. 
Um, this is what our students still learn. So I also, in addition to all the other things that I do at Michigan, another hat that I wear is I do the diabetes lecture series for our medical students. And I'm obligated, just like many of you in the room, to classify diabetes by this nomenclature. But we know the nomenclature of diabetes has evolved over the years. We used to call type 1 uh, insulin-dependent diabetes. Then we used to call it juvenile onset diabetes. And I would posit that our nomenclature even now is antiquated for our understanding of diabetes. And that this idea of insulin deficiency and insulin resistance as classification structures of type 1 and type 2 really is not valid. So to, I, I'm going to give you that at the outset and just say that, you know, we do live in an era where a lot of times our news are informed by facts that support our opinions. So I'm hoping to be a little bit of a contrarian, but hopefully get you to think about diabetes in a similar context, because I think that will educate us as providers and also as scientists in terms of how we advance therapies for diabetes moving forward. So my objective today is to recenter the focus of diabetes pathogenesis, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes on the beta cell, to consider the evidence for similarities and differences between both disease processes with a real focus on the similarities that bind them both together, to evaluate the common molecular mechanisms in the pathogenesis of both diseases, and then also to posit a new paradigm for diabetes pathogenesis existing on a spectrum of one centralized disease thing rather than siloed diseases that stay separate uh, from the time that they're diagnosed. So I'm going to take you on a journey to how I got here, and hopefully you'll come along for this ride. Think a little bit about type 2 diabetes as this spectrum, where we think often about type 2 as this battle between peripheral insulin resistance and insul insufficient insulin secretion. To start out, um, we often think of type 2 diabetes as a disease of obesity. And certainly, I showed you that graphic earlier of this expanding increase in type 2 diabetes pathogenesis that correlates very strongly with obesity and physical inactivity in the United States as well. The, the dirty little secret about this, however, is that while 1 in 10 Americans have diabetes and 1 in 2 Americans are overweight, only one in five overweight Americans have diabetes, meaning 80% of folks that are overweight do not have diabetes. So rather than thinking about diabetes as a disease of obesity and obesity only, we should think about why do four, four out of five overweight patients have no issues with glycemic control whatsoever? So this is a thought that Steve Kahn and Dan Port thought about quite, for quite a while and did these formative studies to look at this hyperbolic relationship between insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity that de were derived from uh, frequently sampled uh, intravenous glucose tolerance tests. Understanding that insulin secretion and sensitivity were on this curve, where based on beta cell function, there could be some responsiveness de dependent on your um, ambient weight, and that the development of diabetes occurred when you fell off of this spectrum due to a reduction in the disposition index driven by the beta cells. So this understanding really changed the idea of type 2 diabetes as, from a disease of obesity to a disease of beta cells. And in recent years, the, the beta cell biology field has evolved our understanding of disease pathogenesis as well, Under, noting that it's not only a reduction in beta cell mass, we know that beta cell mass is very responsive to obesity and that beta cell mass will uh, increase in compensation to obesity. And that at some point during the development of impaired glucose tolerance and ultimately beta cell failure, the beta cell mass can no longer um, keep up with peripheral insulin demand. Certainly this is also something that occurs um, in, in the context of beta cell function where readily releasable pools of insulin granules, studies that were um, driven by Susumo Sano's group in Japan, we understand that these readily reduce, uh, releasable pools of insulin granules, both in the first and second phase, will also rise during obesity, are lost during impaired glucose tolerance, and then ultimately are lost during the development of T2D. So both mass and function in the beta cells are impaired in the development of diabetes. Moreover, um, okay. um, moreover, we have this new and evolving thought that even though this slide is um, several years old, uh, is, is, is uh, uh, very helpful to think about diabetes 
in the context of beta cell dedifferentiation, meaning that beta cells once thought to be lost during the development of diabetes may actually not be lost for all time, that these beta cells may lose their identity, dedifferentiate to beta cell progenitors, and maybe even get reprogrammed to other cell types. And one of the things that I think is valuable about this new model is to think about this being a bidirectional arrow, potentially suggesting that if we can remove these pathogenic defects in beta cells in T2D, we may be able to recover beta cell function that was lost. Now, the genetics of type 2 diabetes also tell us a very similar story. That, the, that this is a, a, you know, an, an annotated list of the genes that we were thought were associated with type 2 diabetes um, over 15 years ago. We know now over 400 loci are associated with type 2 diabetes, worth many more loci still to be discovered. But I think this um, list is quite useful to point out that the majority of genes that are associated with T2D have clear functional roles in the beta cells. So hopefully from this, I've been able to at least share some of the updated info that many of you are already aware of, that beta cells are front and center in the development of type 2 diabetes. Now, as a beta cell biologist, you might say, well, this is a guy, and here we are at UMass with, with Dave and the history of Aldo Rossini here. We know the importance of immunology in diabetes as well, but I'm not a contrarian that says the immune system doesn't matter in diabetes. As a matter of fact, I think immunologic dysfunction is also crucial, not only in type 1, and it, but in type 2 as well. And I think there are several studies that support this. Certainly, uh, work from Mark Donath's group has shown immune infiltration of macrophages into the pancreatic islet, and that these macrophages can exert negative effects on beta cell health and function. Just to orient you, these are these crown-like ma macrophage structures that occur in adipocytes, and the thought that these macrophages are infiltrating the islet and exerting negative effects on the beta cell during the development of this meta-inflammatory disease. Um, similar work more recently from the GRADE study has shown that there's T cell hyperreactivity that occurs in type two that may also lead to impaired beta cell function. So these patients don't have autoimmunity. This was over 400 patients that were evaluated in the GRADE study. These are patients with early onset type two diabetes that were on metformin as a monotherapy to evaluate the ability of metformin to exert beneficial roles during the early stages of type two. And when these patients were uh, profiled, um, peripheral blood and PBMCs were isolated and then T cells were um, uh, developed from those PBMCs in the circulation. And what was uh, done from those samples was that these T cells were then exposed to immunoblocks of pancreatic islet protein from at least uh, uh, seven different donors. And then these immunoblocks were then analyzed to determine about, uh, de determine hyperreactivity to these um, islet antigens in this uh, um, ex vivo context. 40% of the type two diabetic patients had it, um, what was screened as a T cell positivity or a T cell hyperreactivity on this asset. These patients were then subsequently metabolically profiled during a glucose tolerance test. And what you can see is an increase in gl uh, glucose levels after a, a glucose challenge in the patients with these positive T cell responses, in addition to have a, a corresponding reduction in glucose stimulated C peptide levels. So this is clearly only an associative study from, uh, from this great study, but I do think it certainly opens our eyes to the idea that T cell hyperreactivity also occurs in type two diabetes. Um, and, and certainly, I'm, I'm sure more work will be done in this area. Of course, modulating the immune system is not easy. Um, so how could this be done and could be uh, utilized therapeutically, I think, will be the next question. Um, but certainly, this is an eye-opening area, even to me as a beta cell biologist, realizing that the immune system is certainly a potential culprit uh, to be challenged in type 2 as well. So to summarize this little walk through type 2 diabetes, Hopefully, I can give you a little flavor that both clinical and genetic evidence highlight the critical role of beta cells to disease pathogenesis, that the ge genetics of T2D, while still poorly understood, supports clear roles for the beta cell. And I certainly couldn't cover all of the beta cell defects, but beta cell function and numbers go down through a number of mechanisms in T2D, in including dedifferentiation. But a number of these molecular pathogenic defects, which I'll come to towards the end of my talk, 
including oxidative and ER stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, and then highlighting immune-mediated damage as well. And certainly highlighting that obesity and in insulin resistance due to environmental and genetic factors, they clearly still matter. These are necessary components to have T2D, but are not sufficient in, the, in of themselves to cause type 2 diabetes. So what about type 1? Um, many of you in the room, and hopefully even the younger trainees, are familiar with this iconic diagram from George Eisenbarth um, postulating how type 1 diabetes develops. This is one of these graphics that really has withstood the test of time. Um, and I certainly, I think personally, since Dave pointed out my diagnosis in 1986, I often come to this as a touchstone for my own life in terms of thinking about the development of type 1 diabetes. I think um, it, it is clear that there's a genetic predisposition to type 1 as well. We still don't know about the pre precipitating events that are involved in type 1 diabetes. I think certainly there might be considerations uh, for um, viral infections to be a cause, but there may be other things that we still don't quite understand. And this, this uh, sustained loss of beta cell over a period of years that we cannot quantify, potentially due to the different flavors of type 1 diabetes, ultimately result in a state of overt diabetes when your beta cell mass is about 10% of baseline. But certainly there is much action and interest now uh, in this era of uh, T cell modification to maybe intervene during these states when glucose levels are normal, but progressive loss of insulin can be detected before overt disease onset. So again, I wanna challenge this idea of the etiology of type one diabetes, thinking about this concept of the disease not only being one of immune dysfunction, but also potentially being one of beta cell dysfunction. To start out, I think it's often effective to think about the, the lesions that are observed in the pancreas of patients with T1D. We obviously always think about insulitis being a critical signature of, T, of uh, the development of type one diabetes. And I often show this graphic to um, medical students that when I lecture about the etiology of T1D. You can see the beta cells marked in blue on this immunohistochemical image with uh, T cells around the beta cell and this insulitic lesion um, uh, surrounding the islet. And I often query my patients, what is this a, a pathogenic signature of? And they say type one. And I often say, no, that's wrong. That's the NOD mouse. That is not human type one diabetes. We know in the development of human T1D that we see cytotoxic T lymphocytes, but they don't surround every islet. It's often some of the islets, but not all. We certainly also know that this insulitic lesion does not often appear to be as robust as it occurs in the NOD mouse. And yet, the, despite the critical importance of this model to educate us about the development of T1D, this is not human type 1 diabetes. So how do we know that beta cells still matter in the development of the disease? This certainly doesn't answer it, but it may suggest that insulitis alone is not the only uh, uh, causative feature. We also know that the immune cells, while very effective at clearing beta cells in the NOD mouse, may not be as effective in human type 1 as we thought. Um, this is a look at NPOD sections, and here are patients either who are non-diabetic and autoantibody positive, or have had type 1 for many years, in this case, this patient up to 56 years, and yet beta cells are still visible by immunohistochemistry well after diagnosis. So we still have islets that are functional and in the system, yet not sufficient to meet the demands of glycemic control. And it's certainly not just this at the, at the immunohistochemical level, but Dave and Christina Rother, when, they, when Dave was at the NIH, also showed detectable levels of C-peptide well after diagnosis in patients with T1D as well. So um, in the early days of my ventures to think about the roles of beta cells in the development of type 1, often it would be posed to me, if we could just get the islets away from the immune system, these beta cells will recover. The challenge is how do you recover those islets back from live donors? You can't do this. However, in a uh, re relatively recent study in Scandinavia that eventually was found to have some issues, they did uh, attempt to do this, and this is the DIVID trial. And, and I kind of still push back a little bit at the conclusions of what the authors wrote in the study, 
But these were islets that were isolated from pancreatic biopsies that were taken from either non-diabetic um, pancreas donors or donors with type 1 diabetes. And this is a perifusion curve of these islets. And when you take these islets and then you subject them to high glucose, you can see an increase in insulin release in the non-diabetic islets. And in the, in the abstract and in the conclusions of the paper, what the authors say is the type 1 diabetic islets, when they're cultured ex vivo, now are glucose responsive, suggesting that if you remove them from the immune system, they, are, they can recover. Yet, look at the disparity in insulin release between these groups. If, if this was a true recovery, we should see secretory capacity approaching the non-diabetic levels. Yet, this never occurs. And so, one, I'm often struck by the fact that these T1D islets don't truly recover function, suggesting again to me that there may be something fundamentally wrong with these beta cells even after removal from the diabetic milieu. Certainly studies from the DPT-1 also have shown that early lesions in type 1 diabetes are associated with loss of first phase insulin release. This has also been observed in pre-diabetic mice, which we know have a very robust immune response, where you can see uh, this insulin secretory capacity to glucose is lost well before overt insulitis is observed. So I may not have convinced you that beta cell defects predate immunologic problems in type 1. However, a very interesting study was just published in the JCI from the Frida cohort that I think starts again to push back on the idea of what these initial lesions are in type 1 diabetes. So in this study, patients, infants that were at high risk for type 1 diabetes were followed from age four months to three and a half years old using CGM assessments, as well as islet autoantibody uh, uh, measurements. And so these infants and toddlers then were screened for determinants of blood glucose, including genetic risk, BMI, the insulin genotype, and then the risk of developing islet autoantibodies. And I'm summarizing all of the primary data here, but to, to put this into context, these were patients with a notable genetic predisposition. And the first observation in these patients on CGM data were elevations in glucose levels that predated seroconversion to autoantibodies suggesting that the islet autoantibody seroconversion, which we often think is the cause of type 1 diabetes, may have been preceded by an initial beta cell insult. So again, um, this really supports the idea that beta cells are not just along for the ride in type 1, but they very much might be at, involved at the outset of the disease. Now, what about the genetics of type 1 diabetes? So this is, again, a list as of 2010. This is about 40 or 50 genetic loci that have been identified from linkage studies, as well as candidate gene analyses and some of the earliest GWAS studies in T1D. We have a list that's now approximately 60 genes long that are associated with type 1 diabetes. And these genes in red here are all expressing key products that have functions in beta cells as well. So the genetics of type 1 diabetes also support defects in pancreatic beta cells. Now, what about at the uh, histologic level and the ultrastructural level? If you look at beta cells of NOD mice and look at the uh, EM sections of these islets, what you can find are dilations in the ER and then impaired insulin granule formation. You can see a number of these immature secretory granules here in these islets. And these are often phenomena that are associated with early beta cell defects in type 2 diabetes. Yet these are observed before overt insulitis in the NOD mouse. Again, supportive of a beta cell defect that may be involved at the initiation of the disease. And this isn't just an NOD mouse phenomenon. Similar observations have been found in patients with T1D, whether these are folks that are early, that have insulitic lesions and are not, do not have diabetes, or patients um, who have type 1. Um, who either are with or um, without insulin in terms of their immunoreactivity of their, of their islets. And, and so what you can see here are uh, markers of ER stress. This is an immunohistochemical staining for CHOP, and then the ER chaperone VIP that are found in these islets of uh, either patients with um, type 1 or patients that have insulitis that may eventually go on to develop T1D. 
Um, so again, ER stress is found independent of the development uh, yet of type one, but may eventually be a key causative role. So again, I, I turn to uh, recent data as well from, from Dave's group, and I think many of you are probably familiar with these studies, but this is on uh, um, single cell RNA-seq assessments of beta cells um, from uh, donors with T1D compared to non-diabetic controls. And you can see here, these beta cells also express a number of these uh, HLA class two markers um, as well. And so again, this suggests that, it, that the immunologic role of type one is still certainly critical, still certainly part of the game, but beta cells may be getting in on the act to be a mediator of their own demise. So what can we do about this? Can we repurpose therapies to include beta cells? And certainly um, many of you in the room are familiar with teplizumab, but, but therapeutics to target beta cells are, are hopefully more on the way, but we have to approach uh, these therapeutics from an understanding of the pathogenesis. So if we revise our thought of the development of T1D, thinking about early inflammation in the islet, activation of the ER, uh, UPR response and irremediable ER stress leading to beta cell dysfunction, and then the release of these antigens and neoantigens that drive disease, can we inter intervene early in these processes, potentially in the ER and other places, to then help uh, recover beta cell function? Uh, so just, just up the road at, at the School of Public Health many years ago, Godem, uh, Gokhan Hodem Sligel's group did a study treating NOD mice with this ER chaperone Tutka. And here you can see the diabetes incidence um, in the NOD mice treated with this ER chaperone. These many of these animals went up to 30 weeks with, uh, with delayed onset of T1D. You can see here uh, insulin levels it were very similar to those of the NOD mice treated with a vehicle that were considered non-diabetic, while insulin levels obviously dropped in these animals. And then these ER chaperone treated mice had, had still had some development of insulitis, yet these beta cells were resilient and were able to survive for long periods of time just by the relief of ER stress. Now, we don't have agents currently available to remediate ER stress in islets that are currently available in the clinic, but hopefully some of these agents are on the way. However, again, a former NIH colleague of ours, Aneth Shalev, and maybe Aneth has been up here to talk about her experience with verapamil, have therapies that really do target beta cells early in the disease process. And here's the recent study last year, many of you probably have seen from the uh, New England Journal, where patients with early onset T1D were treated with this calcium channel blocker. And you can see an improvement in uh, C-peptide um, levels in patients who are treated with this calcium channel blocker uh, early in the disease state. And while verapamil may have immunologic effects beyond the ones in the beta cell, certainly these mechanistic studies done by Aneth's group clearly support the concept that blockade of these L-type calcium channels, reductions in intracellular calcium levels, seem to relieve stress driven by this uh, key um, uh, uh, pro-oxidant molecule tick SNP to then reduce oxidative stress and then maintain beta cell function and insulin release and prevent oxidative mediated beta cell death. So we already have agents in the clinic that can target beta cells and relieve them in T1D. And hopefully you're treating your patients with these more often. This is a cheap, easy to use and safe compound. But we, at least in my experience at Michigan, one of the most underutilized therapeutics for patients with T1D. So do your patients get better? Do we, do we cure diabetes with this? No, I don't think so. And I, I think, you know, it, it's certainly um, one of the things that I, I don't, I, I'm not saying here in this slide, is I think we need to challenge ourselves to think beyond a magic bullet for treating type one. Certainly if you were, if I was in a room of oncologists and said, we only are gonna treat cancer with a single uh, a chemotherapeutic for, for many difficult uh, and, and difficult to treat cancers, most people would say, you can't treat it with a single chemotherapeutic. I think similarly with the cascade of defects, not only beta cell, but also immunologic, we eventually are gonna to need to move to a multi-therapeutic uh, arsenal uh, to treat diabetes. And, and hopefully that's something that, that we can do here, including verapamil, but also maybe agents that also relieve ER stress. 
Is that something you said just you was in? So what we, what what I've been trying to implore my uh, colleagues uh, and 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 you know my my patient uh, cohort at the VA at the University of Michigan is that our new onset T1D patients should go home with not just a script for insulin but for a script for insulin and verapamil. So it's not just um, uh, verapamil, it's not just agents for ER stress, but this recent letter to the New England Journal also highlights the potential for semaglutide and use of GLP-1 receptor agonists to improve glycemic control in new onset diabetes. And while this was not an appropriately powered study, this was just an observation of 10 patients um, treated within three months of diagnosis, seven of the 10 patients treated in this study were off of insulin for the first year of their diagnosis. And you can see that glycated hemoglobin levels were substantially below these placebo groups for these immunologic studies. They're not being compared to the immunologic uh, therapies, but just to the placebo groups, highlighting the potential for semaglutide, again, a drug that has been repurposed for cardiovascular disease and for type two diabetes, but for the beta cell folks in the room, we know that uh, these initial studies on GLP-1 receptor agonists were initially thought to be a pro-beta cell survival and, and replication uh, target. So again, can we think about utilizing multi-drug arsenals and repurposing type 2 diabetes drugs also to help relieve beta cell stress in type 1? So hopefully, again, from this very short snippet, I've been able to convince you that there's clinical and genetic evidence highlighting the role of beta cells in the pathogenesis of T1D, understanding that the genetics of type 1 diabetes illustrate a role for both immune cells and beta cells in pathogenesis, noting that disruptions of beta cell function in numbers, you can see the themes coming out here, very similar to my conclusions with type 1. We have D-differentiation. I didn't have time to show you these data, but this has also been observed. The key roles for ER and oxidative stress with therapeutics to target these areas. I'll talk a little bit more about mitochondrial dysfunction and type 1 diabetes in a moment. And of course, highlighting this key role from work from Dave and Mike and others of immune-mediated damage as well in type 1. And then also highlighting these key environmental factors that drive type 1 diabetes. So can common mechanisms link both of these diseases, or is beta cell dysfunction uh, derived from maybe similar co um, causes of both diseases. And how am I on time? It's cool. Okay. Another hours. Oh, really? All right. <laughs> you guys have nowhere to go. Um, so um, I, I want to, I, I hopefully in this last little uh, um, uh, snippet, I want to talk about this possibility of beta cell dysfunction being derived from similar causes and take advantage of recent work from Adrian Liston's group in the, in the UK, and this term of beta cell fragility as a risk factor for all forms of diabetes. Thinking about beta cell fragility not as only a type two defect, but also a type one defect. And so I'm gonna summarize this uh, very complicated slide, looking at here's a uh, hierarchical clustering analysis of uh, 126 different genetic loci that are associated either with type one, type two, or gestational diabetes. And then associating these with transcriptomic signatures from the spleen, the pancreas, and the liver, the um, uh, organ systems that we know may have particular involvement with the different forms of diabetes. And what you can see amongst these 126 different gene loci are that, the, that there is no hierarchical clustering by the different disease type, type two in green, type one in blue, GDM in red, and similarly, very similar gene expression patterns for these 126 different genes across these very different tissues. And uh, analyses of these uh, gene expression signatures, again, don't show segregation by the type of diabetes. So is it, is it more possible that the genetics are talking about shared pathology, but that might be different in an environmental context? So if you don't believe me, Maybe we can look at this at a more granular level. So this, this is uh, work from 2008, looking at very select genetic loci that are highly associated with type one, type two, um, and then seeing if any of these shared loci are found in light LADA patients, who often are thought to be a little bit of, have a little bit of defects associated with both disease forms. 
And so here you can see the HLA risk is much higher in type one than in controls as we would expect. It's also elevated in, in later patients, but there is some HLA involvement in type two. Um, similarly, if you look at um, PTPN, or I'm sorry, the, in, the insulin uh, variable nucleotide tandem repeat, certainly this is a, so increased in type one and not increased in type two and found in later patients. Again, supporting this idea that there may be a more of a type one signature in these patients. But if you come all the way here to TCF7L2, a well-known and highest uh, odds ratio for the development of T2D, you see a very similar signature with LEDA as well. So these gene signatures of LEDA kind of take elements of both diseases and suggest, again, even genetically, these diseases are not quite as far apart. Another gene that is uh, very commonly associated not only with type 1, but type 2 and neonatal diabetes is this transcription factor GLIS3. And GLIS3 is a key transcription factor that regulates pancreatic islet development, insulin gene transcription, as well as beta cell growth and replication, and um, are, is known to be involved in the prevention of beta cell apoptosis. And so again, this gene that's associated genetically with these three distinct diseases plays central roles that can be important in the pathogenesis of all the diseases. So finally, I just want to wrap up, as Dave highlighted, with my favorite gene, CLEX16A, um, a gene that I came across during my postdoc that was a T1D of, uh, uh, gene of unknown function. Um, and we knew when I uh, came on to my, to my work at Penn that the gene was ubiquitously expressed. It was found in islet cells, but it was also found in immune cells, yet nothing of its function was, was known at the time. Um, so initially, I tried to endeavor to understand better the, the role of CLEC in type 1 diabetes, but hopefully by the end, I'll make you think, could CLEC16A also be yet another example of molecular targets with importance in both disease states? So just to start with the granular details, and sorry, this is published, so I'll go through this quickly, but a diabetogenic polymorphism that is uh, associated with type 1 diabetes we use these, uh, this polymorphism to segregate based on uh, islet collect 16 a expression in human islets of non-diabetic donors. And what you can find is that the diabetogenic polymorphism leads to reduced collect 16 a expression in islets. This was associated with reductions in HOMA beta, which is a measure of beta cell function, yet no changes in HOMA IR and was also found to be associated with elevations in hemoglobin A1C. And I should just point this out. These are assessments that we did on non-diabetic humans. So there is no immune involvement here in these analyses. And you can see that this type one polymorphism drives beta cell changes. So we modeled this in, in an animal model, uh, generating a pancreatic specific CLEC16A knockout mice, mouse. These animals have glucose intolerance, impaired glucose simulated insulin release. And yet when we looked histologically at these islets, the islets appeared uh, intact and there was no evidence of insulitis in these animals whatsoever. Again, driving at a key point of CLEX 16A within the beta cell. When we looked at these islets ultrastructurally, this is where our observations of mitophagy first came through. Here are mitochondria that appear in normal uh, beta cells. Here you can see these electron dense insulin granules, and then you can see these um, uh, mitochondrial networks with their well appointed cristae. And then here's an islet from a pancreas specific CLEX 16A knockout. And you can see these very disrupted mitochondria with inclusions, and some of these also being engulfed in autophagosome like structures. So, just a quick assessment on mitochondrial turnover mediated by mitophagy. We know you need mitochondria to generate the energy for normal beta cell function, but unhealthy mitochondria need to be cleared by the cell as well. And so normally mitochondria are cleared through this process called mitophagy, where they're targeted to the autophagosome and then the lysosome to clear them around, to clear them out in the wastebasket of, of, of the cell. And so this key loss of CLEX 16A then promotes the accumulation of these sick mitochondria that then lead to beta cell dysfunction in our animal models. Now, what about in type two diabetes? So I mentioned that maybe there could be a role for CLEC and mitophagy in type two as well. So these are EMs of beta cells from type two diabetic islet donors 
So here again are the mitochondria with their normal appearing cristae. And then the mitos in type two are dilated. They lose their cristae structure. Their shape are abnormal as well. So that this led us to ask, could CLEC16A be uh, down-regulated and potentially defective across the spectrum of diabetes? So we first turned our attention to animal models here in collaboration with uh, Raghu Miramiri's group at the University of Chicago. We looked at CLEC16A expression in the NOD mouse and found that pre-diabetic NOD mice had reduced CLEC16A expression. But not only the NOD mice, non-skid mice that should not have the immunologic defect that you observe in the NOD also have reduced islet CLEC16A expression, potentially suggesting an intrinsic defect in, in these islets. We looked at islets of the DVDB mouse model with type 2 diabetes and saw a progressive loss of CLEC16A over time. And then um, looking at the PDX1 HET mouse, which is a mouse model not only of early onset T2D, but also of MODI4 we can see these mice have reduced CLEC levels as well. And microarray studies from uh, Ron Kahn's group from islets have also shown reduced CLEC-16A expression in the islets of type 2 donors. Now, just to be clear, CLEC may be down in these models, but I'm not saying CLEC is a risk gene for type 2 diabetes, but that doesn't mean it couldn't be a pathogenic target. And so this is, the, in the last couple of slides, I just want to show you some uh, published and unpublished work that we did to try to really interrogate this in, in detail. So here we generated a beta cell specific rather than our pancreas specific CLEC16A knockout, and then treated these islets ex vivo with pro-inflammatory cytokines to model T1D. And what you can see is the CLEC16A knockouts have profound increases in beta cell death. We also tried the, the converse experiment in human islets where we transduced human islets with CLEC16A as a gain-of-function approach. When we did this here, you can see that CLEC16A gain-of-function strongly reduces beta cell apoptosis after cytokines. And with our initial studies, almost completely abrogated beta cell death. So to, uh, I went back to my postdoc and said, this is not believable. You need to hit these cells with even higher doses of cytokines. And he he nearly, uh, uh, I think he increased the IL-1 beta concentrations by almost 20-fold. And then he could see that he was starting to make beta cell death a little bit worse in these settings. So this shows that CLEC16A can have some beneficial roles to prevent cytotoxic-mediated beta cell death. Now, I mentioned these observations with type 2 diabetes. So then we took our beta cell-specific CLEC16A knockouts and put these animals on a high-fat diet. And so what you can see here is our uh, regular fat uh, fed mice after being treated for 12 weeks with a high fat diet have modest glucose intolerance. Here our beta cell specific CLEC16A knockouts have uh, glucose intolerance, but certainly not profound increases in glucose levels, but subjecting these animals to a uh, high fat diet and obesity dramatically increases hyperglycemia. We then looked at beta cell mass in these animals that, is, that are not regularly lost on a regular fat diet, but these high fat diet fed CLEC16A mice no longer can have a compensatory beta cell mass expansion to diet induced obesity. Now on the previous slide, I mentioned to you that cytotoxic uh, cytokine exposure increases beta cell death in the CLEC16A knockout. So when we started this study with high fat diet, we expected to see the same thing. We lost beta cell mass, and so we looked at uh, apoptosis by tunnel staining, and yet we see no differences in beta cell death. Then we wondered, well, maybe they're just not replicating as well. However, these high-fat fed CLEC16A knockouts, not only did they not have reduced replication, it seemed like they were replicating more. So again, this puzzled us uh, greatly. So we did some transcriptomic profiling and assessed these differential transcriptomic signatures and found these high-fat fed CLEC16A mice have strong signatures of beta cell immaturity and signatures associated with beta cell dedifferentiation. So here, this, this is just some immunostaining of these animals where you can see this mature beta cell marker, uricortin 3, is lost in the CLEC16A knockout animals. This D, um, GLUT2, which is another beta cell maturation marker, this key glucose transporter is lost in these animals. And then we see an acquisition of this dedifferentiation marker, ALDH1A3. And so this suggests that CLEC16A can contribute to beta cell failure in models of T1D and T2D, 
but is very much driven by the environmental cues. And so this is, again, why I think that we can think about these diseases maybe in slightly different ways, but very much based on the environmental context. The one final thing I want you to think about here is that in diabetes, the pathogenic uh, lesions may not be as different as you think. In type 1 and type 2, we have a loss of first phase insulin release. In type 1 and type 2, we have evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction. In type 1 and type 2, we have ER stress, immune dysregulation, genetic risk, in some cases shared genetic risk, and in uh, type 2, we clearly know of an obesity risk, but there's also been reports of obesity risk in young adults that go on to develop type 1 as well. And to point out that it is likely that no single clinical feature or diagnostic parameter completely discriminate, discriminates the two diseases. So hopefully I've been able to convince you that diabetes are not these diseases in silos, that we are living in an era with human diabetes really being on a spectrum where beta cell dysfunction and immunologic dysfunction rule the roost in both cases, but it may be a manner of flavors, not necessarily diametrically opposed processes. So just to wrap up, both forms of diseases share striking similarities, and hopefully a focus on therapies to treat beta cell dysfunction can be useful in both type 1 and type 2, and that shifting diabetes care to incorporate the best of both diabetes worlds, both therapeutically and from a clinical care context, is vital to improve the paradigm of 21st century uh, diabetes care. And certainly, diabetes is a difficult disease. It is very uh, difficult as a patient and as a provider to stay optimistic. But I, I always feel like I can't finish a talk channeling my inner Dave without an inspirational quote. And here I chose one, not from Lincoln, but from Ovid, just thinking that my hopes are not always realized, but I do always hope. Uh, just lastly, to acknowledge the tremendous amount of work from my group, as well as a wonderful series of collaborators and then funding support uh, that went to some of those new studies here that I showed today. Um, I'll stop there and take any questions and thank you so much for your attention. Hi, Dr. Solomon Ford. That was uh, really, really an amazing talk. Thank you so much. I wish I could be there in person, but unfortunately I'm in Leominster, so I, I couldn't be there. One of the things that you started off with, I wanted to ask your opinion on, we have moved away from like nomenclature of conditions, like start treating, first of all, diabetes as a condition more than just a, you know, a disease. Focusing on nomenclature that is descriptive or talks about pathogenesis and using words like, you know, insulin dependent or type 1 or type 2. Do you know of any efforts by the ADA or any other organization? To Certainly um, about, I think, 15 years ago or so, there were a couple of small studies, but I think quite useful about positing a new nomenclature, this AB model where A being evidence of autoimmunity and B being a description of beta cell function. Uh, and, and you know, your, your classical type 1 diabetes in the textbook would be considered A, a plus B minus, right? Um, meaning you have no beta cell function, but you have positive autoantibodies. And so I think that maybe movement towards something like that AB model could be useful, but certainly there may be more to it than that. Um, but I think hopefully there, there are people taking notice that these old silos, they just don't really work so well anymore. And, and you know, you might say, well, why does that matter? And I think part of the reason it matters is because, not just because how we as providers characterize patients, but really it matters. And we were talking about this at dinner last night. If you want to get a GLP-1 receptor agonist for a patient with type 1 diabetes who's overweight, we know, again, 50% of the U.S. population is overweight. Yet GLP-1 receptor agonists are not approved for treatment of type 1 diabetes because the pharmaceutical companies did not seek FDA approval. Yet we know the drugs are very effective in these patients. And so reimagining re the nomenclature may op up, open up possibilities that some of these very effective T2D drugs could enter in the type 1 diabetes space and have really substantial outcomes for our patients. So that's a great question with me. So we'll have to see what happens there. So you did mention like the purple meal, but also about the semaglutide GLP-1 mm -hmm. agonist. Historically in type 1 diabetes, usually we always start with insulin and if the patient is obese or they're uncontrolled, we start thinking about mm -hmm. adding a GLP-1 agonist. You did say the help was the regeneration. 
I don't know if you suggest to approach maybe starting early on when you still have some residual beta cells that you might help to regenerate. Yeah, I you know, so there clearly are some very nice recent clinical trials that show that in obese type one semaglutide are really good at reducing body weight, as you might expect, reducing insulin demands that might be good and improving glycemic control. But from a pathophysiologic therapeutic context of beta cell regeneration, you know, a lot of those studies in type 1 diabetes were done in genetic models and were done, done some 20 years ago and then were forgotten about, right? So very nice studies. I'm thinking of work from Dan Drucker's group that showed that you could treat, uh, you know, NOD mice with Exendin-4 and then they will have beneficial effects. And then they were mostly forgotten about. So um, there were clinical studies using shorter acting GLP-1 receptor agonists that didn't show as much benefit. And then this work on semaglutide, you know, this was not a rigorous clinical trial, right? This was a letter to the editor of New England Journal. It was 10 patients. But I think there is an interesting uh, parable in there. There's some potential that I think we should at least dust this off and think about, you know, in, this, in their letter, they said, did we delay the honeymoon phase? Did we offload work from the beta cell? Is there some, you know, effect on the beta cells or on the immunologic function? None of that was investigated. But at least, you know, you have to start somewhere. And I think it's intriguing to think about this and then to think, can you extend the lifespan of endogenous beta cells um, that may have very formative impacts? We, we know from the DCCT and EDICT study that if you have preserved beta cell function, your risk of complications goes down tremendously. And so it may not be so important to think about, oh, is this C peptide that's detectable? Does it really matter? It, it, it clearly does. Um, so how do we do this? We have to do this with safe and effective treatments, right? I think verapamil is a great candidate. And so far, um, GLP-1 receptor agonists do seem quite safe for long-term use. So, you know, I think it's, it, it hopefully will inspire you know, my, my friends here in the clinical audience, we should be doing studies and seeing if there's a role for semaglutide in the arsenal as well. When Scott was at the NIH, his desk was right next to a national lab. So that there must have been something magic in the air or water because they've both gone on to tremendous careers. I like to think that I absorbed it from her through osmosis. <laughs> I was lucky. <laughs> she would say the same. That's club common number. The other thing I would say is Scott, as the director of JRF Center at the University of Michigan convened a, a consensus conference about a year ago. And Scott and I and a few others, one of the questions was, is it the immune system or the beta cell? And I think we won the day. I think people were saying the beta cell's the culprit here. And I have always said, even going way back, and even George Eisenbarth had taught this before he died, we've always said there's an association between these immune genes and type 1 diabetes. Therefore, it's immune-mediated. So all of these efforts, we've, we've spent billions of dollars on immunotherapeutic trials for type 1 diabetes, and only teplizumab has made it. What if we were wrong this whole time? We should have been focusing on, you know, ER stress, mitochondrial stress. The, the data is building up. I think this is how movements start. Uh, it's been a five-decade misadventure that I think we're finally figuring out in Scott's Clex 16 and a death, tick sniff, those things are leading the charge, I think. Thank you. It was terrific. To